Looks like there's a few people still joining, but for everybody who's here on time, let's go ahead and get rolling. Welcome. I have the honor uh, to welcome everybody today. I'm Michelle Sullivan, the Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at Boston University's College of Communication. And on behalf of Dean Mariette DeCristina and all of us at BU's College of Communication, we're so grateful to our wonderful panel today and to our moderator, Amy Chandler. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, to, to this afternoon, we're going to discuss um, speech writing, capturing the voice of one to address many, our conversation this morning, this afternoon, we'll talk about um, when we think about great speeches, what comes to mind? What about a speech makes it so great? Everyday speech writers have the difficult task of writing speeches that not only capture the voice of the person giving that speech, but also resonate with the audience they're addressing. In this conversation, we'll discuss the art of speech writing and skills needed to, to become a great speech writer. We'll also look at speech writing from a diverse and inclusive lens in how we recognize speech writers from historically marginalized communities and provide ways to foster and mentor the next generation. So to lead us through that discussion, I am going to introduce our esteemed panel. Again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, first, Michael Franklin, who is the co-founder and executive director of Speech Writers of Color. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and he's an experienced coalition builder, civic engagement organizer, and communication strategist. Michael is dedicated to ensuring you're meeting the moment and creating impact with your communications and philanthropic efforts through all those he works with. He's a proud graduate of Howard University. He has extensive experience crafting communications and digital strategic plans, ghostwriting, and targeted coalition building. Michael has additional experience in creating and executing projects for leaders across the country, from progressive leaders and world-renowned athletes to corporate executives and nonprofit leaders. You can learn more about his work at wordsnormalizebehavior.com. Our next panelist, welcome is Nancy Kwan, um, who's a graduate of Boston University's Medical School, upcoming 2024, an, enroll, an enrolled student, um, and a former speechwriter for Boston Mayor Marty Walsh and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Nancy Kwan is a communications specialist with extensive experience in speech writing and executive communications, primarily in government and political settings. As I said, she served as the speechwriter for the former mayor of Boston, Marty Walsh, for over seven years. Her other past experience includes serving as assistant director of speech writing and executive communications for the CEO and president of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and assistant communications director for the president of the Massachusetts Senate. She also taught a speech writing course at Emerson College. She holds a BS degree in political communications with a minor in health communications from Emerson College, and she's currently pursuing an MS degree in mental health counseling and behavioral science, excuse me, behavioral medicine at the Boston University Trebanian and Avidasian School of Medicine. She plans to combine her passions for storytelling and mental health to focus on narrative therapy. Welcome again, Nancy. Thank you. And Thank you. Our third panelist is Ezra Bailey Wang, who's the director of speech writing for Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. Ezra is a speech writer, poet, and essayist exploring the ways that language can shift perspectives, shape policies, and produce more equitable outcomes for all of us. His approach to his work is informed by his experience as the mixed race child of a queer parent and a first generation immigrant parent. He currently serves as director of speech writing for Boston Mayor Michelle Wu, the first woman, first millennial, and first person of color ever elected to that office. Previously, Ezra was a director at West Wing Writers. Before that, he served as speech writer to the executive director of the Inclusion Playbook, sports impact project focused on LGBTQ plus inclusion in athletics. When he's not writing, you can find Ezra reading books climbing rocks, and agonizing over the pangram on the New York Times spelling bank. And welcome to Ezra. 
and all three of our panelists once again. I'm now going to introduce our moderator and turn the virtual microphone over to her. It's my pleasure to introduce Amy Chandler, who, as I said, will moderate today's panel. Amy is an associate professor of the practice in public relations and associate chair of the Department of Mass Communication, Advertising, and Public Relations here at Boston University College of Communication, where she holds both her undergraduate degree um, and a graduate degree and she also holds an undergraduate degree from Boston University's College of Arts and Science. Amy has over 25 years of experience in public relations and helping her organizations and clients tell their stories and engage their stakeholders through a variety of tactics. She's written speeches for a diverse range of spokespeople from Hollywood teen stars to C-level executives to nonprofit founders. Currently, Amy directs, co-directs the award-winning PR lab here at BU's College of Communications, the nation's longest, nation's longest running student-led ad public, excuse me, public relations agency, and teaches courses on media relations, principles of public relations, and crisis communications. Amy has both corporate and agency experience with director roles at Phillips, Royal Phillips and Staples, as well as PR manager positions for a division of IBM and a subsidiary of Fleischmann Hillard. Amy, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. Thank you so much again, all of you. We're looking forward to a great conversation. Thanks so much, Michelle, for the warm welcome, and thank you for the College of Communication, Diversity, Equity, and, and Inclusion Committee, who is bringing us this event today. I want to kick us off by talking you know, helping to get to know you a little bit more. We've all heard your impressive bios, Michael, Ezra, and Nancy, but I'd love to hear what you consider to be a memorable speech. Can you think of a speech that you heard that motivated you or influenced you, moved you, or maybe just stuck with you and why? So not sure who wants to kick that one off. Nancy, why don't you take it? <laughs> sure, I'm happy to. Um, so, uh, when I was in high school, um, I really loved English. I loved rhetorical analysis. I knew I wanted to do something with writing. I just wasn't sure what it was. Um, and this was during the 2008 election. So um, it was the first year that I could um, vote in an election. So I was really excited about that. I had, I didn't think I had had any interest in politics, but I got so swept up by the energy and excitement of it. Um, and so I was watching the Democratic National Convention that summer. And I was really struck by um, a part of uh, former President Bill Clinton's speech where he said, uh, people all over the world have been uh, more impressed by the power of our example than by the example of our power. And that line to this day just sticks with me. And actually it's funny because President Biden used that line in his State of the Union yesterday. Um, it's a very powerful line and, and, um, and that really got me thinking, like, wow, like did he write that or who wrote that? How can I get that job? And that basically led me into political communication as my major at Emerson. That's great, Nancy. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Ezra, do you want to share next? Yeah. Um, so I, I wrote previously while I was at West Wing Writers, I wrote a piece on uh, Barack Obama's 2004 DNC speech um, and its exploration between the relationship um, between hope and bravery. And I think politically, that was a speech that really um, sort of catalyzed my interest in, in speech writing as a tool for uh, galvanizing political movements and, and compelling people to, to take political action to, to engage civically. But I also come to speech writing from a background in poetry, a love of language, uh, on a on a sort of deeper, more granular, almost like on a metrical level, right? Obsessing over the story, the sound, the syntax, the syllables, um, and in terms of just straight up powerful, poignant writing, uh, poet Diane Seuss delivered a commencement address in 2022 to the Bennington Writing Seminar. Uh, where she really she gets into sort of dissecting poetry and the act of storytelling and the connection that words are able to form between individuals on an interpersonal level in a way that I think is really powerful and, and speaks to me to this day. Thank you, Ezra, for sharing. Uh, Michael, let's hear from you. Um, for me, I very much think it has to be um, Jim Valvano's speech at the ESPYs, Jimmy V., 
where his charge to the audience was every day you should laugh, every day you should spend some time and thought, and every day your emotions should move you to tears. Because if you laugh, think, and cry, then that's a hell of a day. And that's always resonated with me because if you really are going through such deep and impactful emotions, then he's right. It's a hell of a day. And it was also especially meaningful because it was a, one of his last public appearances and last public speeches before he passed away. But just that type of speech and in that type of venue, I think, is really important and something I think about very often and trying to inspire motivational calls to actions with folks that I work with. Thank you so much, Michael, Ezra, and Nancy. It's, it's great to hear these examples of speeches that have stuck with you. And Michael, you started to segue into our, our next topic, which is really giving us a, a look at what is the role of the speechwriter. We'd love to hear about how you describe the job and, and also why somebody should consider pursuing this career. Uh, Michael, will you start us off this time? Hey, absolutely. Okay. To me, I think the role of a speechwriter is to be a strategist because we help tell the story, we help shape the narrative, and we deliver the facts. But at the end of the day, we serve as a thought partner, especially with whoever we're working with. And it's not just a job you have, but to me, it's the job to have because there's a lot of quiet power that you also get to jump the line compared to a chief of staff or a legislative director or a policy director, because you can fairly quickly become a speechwriter, but suddenly you're having access to leaders with a nationwide to worldwide impact. And being a speechwriter, you end up creating and developing the words that are the first medium to make things accessible to the broader community and broader public and being able to help shape and cultivate those messages is powerful. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, who wants to hop in next? Um, I'm happy to, to hop in. Okay. Um, I, I completely agree. And I think it's, it's an amazing um, power and influence that you have in actually writing the message and seeing what words can do. Um, and I think that being a speechwriter is for me, um, really about being the storyteller um, and just trying to put like a human face to like, let's say you're writing about a city, a city policy or, um, or something else. It, it really brings the human experience um, and that can really um, touch people in a way that I think is, um, is really special. So yeah, I think that's storytelling. Absolutely. That's great. Um, Ezra, do you have anything that you want to add or should we? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I have always viewed the role of speechwriter as twofold. One, to steward your principal's voice, and two, to refine it. And I think the first stems from the fact that as a speechwriter, most likely you're writing for someone um, who is surrounded by a lot of very intelligent people with a lot of their own opinions and ways of thinking about things and also ways of saying things. And as a speechwriter, it is your responsibility to ensure that you retain your principal's voice in the midst of all of that. And then the second piece is about sort of synthesizing all of those voices, sifting through the noise and using uh, the things of value there to sort of inform a fortification of, of your principal's voice, that refining element to strengthen and evolve their voice over time, but in a way, of course, that remains authentic to them. Thank you so much. And just for the, the group, I just want to clarify, when we're using the word principal, that's the word that our speech writers use to refer to the person for whom they're writing. Uh, so that's, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, thank you so much for that. So uh, when we think about your next assignment, I know that you're, you're all very busy right now, but you know, what's your process to ensure that you're going to craft a meaningful and effective speech? And uh, Ezra, I'll bounce this to you first. Yeah, I think any writing process, but particularly speech writing, begins with empathy. I think I think it must, it has to, right? In order to convey something in a way that is comprehensible, not to mention well-received, you have to be able to imagine deeply into what your audience wants to be hearing from you. Is it reassurance, inspiration, direction, distraction? I, and I think you arrive at that empathy through some combination of research, engagement, and imagination. Um, but I think that every process has to has to begin from a place of deep understanding in order to be effective. And then um, perhaps in the Q&A, we can get into sort of some of the more granular tactical aspects of what that process actually looks like for me. I know it varies for every single writer, um, but I will leave it there for now. 
And I was just, uh, thank you for that note about the Q&A, Ezra. Uh, for our audience members, if you have questions, we are monitoring. Uh, we can take, take your questions in the queue at any time, and, and I will make sure that we get those questions answered. Um, so when you think about um, your process, Nancy, you know, what's, what's your approach? Yeah, so, um, so just echoing what Ezra said, everyone has their different process. Um, I think one of the scariest things for any writer is seeing a blank page. Um, and so <laughs> I try to start with the little details, which end up being really important of the more granular details of who's in the audience, what am I trying to convey, you know, gratitude, um, compassion, you know, understanding, um, the program itself, when is the principal going to be speaking? So they start off with those kind of details to kind of I'll slowly make my way into the process of, you know, getting more like details. And um, I think that speech writing also involves a lot of research. Um, I usually spend most of my time doing research, actually, and then um, not so much time doing the writing just because I like to, at least for my process, I want to make sure I have like the big picture, even though I'm whittling it down to, let's say, like a two minute speech. It's helpful for me to have the big picture to start with. Um, so it's kind of like putting a, a puzzle together, really putting the different pieces in. Michael, you're nodding. <laughs> yeah, because I completely agree, especially in putting the pieces of a puzzle together, especially because there'll be some times where I'm writing the conclusion first before <laughs> even getting to the intro or the body, whatever it may be. I will say though, some core parts of my process are always trying to get some answers to key questions from the principal at first. So first it's, what are the feelings that you hope to elicit from this speaking engagement? What do you hope to accomplish when you speak with the audience? What are three feelings that you want people to walk away with after your speech is completed? Then that's when I get into the nitty gritty of research and outlining and developing a draft, which can just come in all different sorts of ways. However, that's the optimal process because being a speech writer, you end up getting lots of rushed requests, especially if you work in politics or areas of rapid response. So like that process is optimal, but oftentimes you have to really do a fast forward like version of it where you don't get to walk through every single bit of it. But I still, I love this idea of, you know, process, empathy, big picture vision and synthesizing it all together. It's, it's definitely quite an art form. And one of the questions that we have from our audience is, you know, should you get trained as a speech writer or, you know, what would you, what would you recommend to do in order to be trained as a speech writer? I think, um, there, oh, sorry, Michael, you can go. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say there, there's so many different pathways into speech writing. Um, and I, you know, just from looking at the three of our paths, they're, they're all very different. Um, I think that writing for someone to actually speak your words is so different than any other kind of writing. Um, sometimes I kind of throw grammar out the window because it doesn't, it would sound kind of robotic if someone were reading the way you would write. Um, but I think um, in terms of getting experience, if there's any kind of course you can take on speech writing, like if you go to a, a communication school or something, um, let's say you want to be involved in politics, if you work on a campaign volunteering to you know, help write some stump speeches or something. I think there's a lot of different avenues into it. And Michael, what were you going to add? Yeah, I would add that there is no proper path into speech writing because more often than not, most folks that like you talk to will say, I just fell into it or I wrote something one time and now I'm a speech writer. And for me, I really see it as just the base level of being here at this event, learning the awareness that this is a profession and this is a career opportunity is the first step in actually training yourself into getting into this field. Because knowing it exists and knowing it's an option and that everybody in their mama has a speechwriter across every industry means that you now can take the steps of writing whether it's volunteering on campus, even I'd say reaching out to your deans and assistant deans in the School of Communications. And if they're doing a panel or something, it could be writing the introductory remarks like we heard before this event. Those are opportunities to at least get your feet wet in the field, but suddenly then you have a writing sample of writing for someone else. 
and just operating from there. So maybe it's passion projects or organizations off campus or even on campus organizations writing on behalf of those leaders. That's how you can start to build a portfolio with things that you care about too. Yeah, such great suggestions. Thank you. We're getting a couple of questions uh, or questions sort of on the flip side. You know, this is sort of how to get good at speech writing, but how do you know if someone's not good at speech writing? Uh, are there some key qualities that either you need to have or some people are missing in order to be successful in this field? I love this question because um, in college, I, I minored in poetry and there was a constant sort of tension um, and battle that was staged between the poets in the class and the professors who were sort of like the keepers of the realm um, around this question of whether or not there could be such a thing as as bad poetry and whether or not there could be such a thing as bad art. And I think with anything that is an art form, um, I think it's a valid like sort of philosophical question, but I think for the purposes of viewing it through the lens of a profession, I think the metrics by which you determine the quality of a speech must again sort of be predicated on the reception of the audience, right? Like, are you connecting with the audience that you're hoping to connect with? If it is a traditional speech that sort of follows the Monroe's motivated sequence of hook, problem, solution, visualization, call to action, was your call to action effective? If you ended the speech by asking people to vote for you, and they didn't vote for you, then probably it was a bad speech. Um, and of course, that's an enormously uh, reductionist take on all of the different political factors that might go into why someone may or may not vote for you. But sort of as you're thinking about whether or not a speech is effective and whether or not someone is or is not a good speechwriter, I think the primary thing that needs to be considered is whether or not they're succeeding in connecting with the audience and compelling the audience to do whatever it is that the speaker is hoping that they will do. What action will they take? how what has their thinking been transformed or not been transformed? Yeah, that's really helpful, Ezra. Thank you for that perspective. Um, let's switch gears and talk about working with your principal a little bit um, at a high level. How do you get to know the values and the voice of that person that you're writing for so that you can help them deliver a compelling speech that is something they would actually say and that does have that, that impact that you're talking about? I'll put you on the spot, Michael. You can go first for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so with this, I call it principal mapping, actually, in terms of I like to interview my principals to get a feel for their formative experiences, how they think, and things that I can't find on Google. So it might be literally asking, like, who are three leaders that, like, you emulate, you know, or, like, who you hope to be in the same vein as and how you represent yourself as a leader. I think that's super important because those story, and then also like, what's the time you failed like really badly at something? And like, what did you learn from it? Because building my own story bank and having those stories is important towards really building authentic and cohesive messages that reflect the principle that I'm writing for. That's really helpful. Nancy or Ezra, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I think um, kind of on the flip side of that, um, you know, let's say you're writing for someone who you don't actually get to sit down with because they're extremely busy, um, which definitely was my experience working for the mayor of Boston. Um, they, you know, being a speech writer, they, the principal puts their trust in you to figure out, you know, what they need to say, what kind of values need to come across, how they're going to connect with the audience. Um, and so any kind of information you can take in, whether it's watching them deliver another speech or, you know, give an interview or something like that. If they've written a book, that's a great way to get a feel for their voice. Um, and just observing their mannerisms, their cadence, um, and that can help you, you know, if you are kind of limited on the actual one-on-one -on -one interaction you can have. 100%, just very quickly to echo Nancy's remarks, I think, um, osmosis is such a valuable tool, right? Like I try and just be around the mayor as often as I can. And also this mayor has, has been very explicit about the ways in which she has put her faith and trust and vision, like um, is aligned in the vision of the chiefs that she's deputized. And so just being in the room for a variety of different meetings, if I can't be with her when she's talking about climate, then spending time with our chief of um, you know, energy environment and open spaces, that's a decent proxy, knowing that this is the person that she trusts to 
champion her vision on climate is is a decent proxy for getting exposure to the kinds of ideas um, that are that are driving the thinking behind her words. And I think there's there was a partner at Western Writers where I used to work who often used to say when our clients tell us that it that a speech doesn't sound like them, what they're really saying is that it doesn't think like them. And so really getting intimately familiar with the perspectives, the stances, the arguments that drive the the fundamental sort of values and belief system of the person that you're writing for can be just as valuable as also just kind of being a fly on the wall in the conversations to hear their rhetorical mannerisms, whether or not they use contractions, the kinds of metaphor that they like, all of those sorts of things, both the tactical and the theoretical exposure is just impossible to overstate the importance of. That's great to know. And in addition to, to that exposure and that osmosis, is there any other kind of research that you do? I know, Nancy, you talked a little bit about some of the, the bigger picture thinking that you do, but, um, you know, reading about the issue or interviewing other experts, you know, what other types of inputs do you have when putting together your speeches? Is there anything else? Ezra, what else do you turn to? I can say that one of my favorite parts of this job and, and one um, that I was that I discovered relatively early on and I'm so grateful and lucky to have discovered so early on is the city of Boston archives and the wonderful team of archivists who work there uh, regularly for our larger speeches. We reach out to them um, and sometimes with like the vaguest requests, uh, for example, like with the Municipal Research Bureau last year, um, we reached out to them with an ask that was just sort of like an organizing idea, right? Like a narrative North Star. Is there something within Boston's history that um, has grown popular or has been successful that initially at its origination faced a ton of backlash or pushback or, or opposition? And what they came back with was this incredible story about, um, as as most of us probably know, Boston is home to the first subway system in the country. But when construction was to begin on it, or when that proposal was put forth to break ground on the first subway system, businesses all along Tremont Street were incredibly opposed to it because they thought that construction was going to be disruptive to customers coming in. And at the time, there was also a lot of superstition around breaking ground because there were dead bodies buried underneath the ground. And folks were superstitious that spirits were going to come up. And also people thought that it would, you know, force snakes and rats and all these other pests living underground up into the streets and they would take over the city. So there was all this like wild imagining around the downside to what has been, you know, really important innovation, um, public transit in, in our nation. Um, and so that was just like an incredible nugget of research that you know, I was lucky enough to be able to to receive from from our wonderful team at the archives. So we all don't have a team of archivists at our disposal. So Michael or Nancy, is there anything else that you're doing to help you prepare that we haven't covered? Um, um, so, oh, I'm so sorry, Michael. You go first, please. <laughs> uh, I would add. So for I have. And starting in kindergarten, my grandma and I did a lot of genealogy research with each other, but it was back before, like, all the different databases were really on Ancestry.com. So it was finding lots of records by hand. And so through that, like, I learned a lot of targeted Google searching in terms of, like, potential misspellings of things or how things are written differently. So with like speech writing, for example, not just target searching speech writing is one word, but it might be writing speeches or speech writing is two words and like all of these variations in order to find what you might be looking for. And so that's helps me a lot. And if I'm looking for really specific information, how it may have been referenced in the past and getting really specific, but in different ways, because it may have been articulated differently. That's such an interesting perspective, and, and I don't think about that often enough. So that's a good, helpful tip for any type of communicator to think about that. Uh, Nancy, what were you going to add? Um, I was just going to add, I, I had a really um, amazing opportunity to work at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Um, and I didn't have much background in science writing. Um, I didn't really come from a science background, and so that kind of made me nervous. Um, but we had a team of amazing science writers. Um, who work directly with doctors and researchers. And so if I was going to write a speech about this new immunotherapy cancer drug or this new target or something, um, they would be an incredible resource. And I could just 
ask them, hey, can you tell me in layman's terms what this means? Um, and so really being able to extract the value from that and not get too bogged down in uh, the scientific jargon. Yeah, it's really helpful. And, and uh, so definitely tapping into experts, tapping into research that exists, um, that all helps. A uh, couple, a little bit more on the principle. How much do you consider the ability of the speaker to deliver a speech? So, do, you know, do you think about any of the uh, habits that they might have, speech impediments, or, or maybe even somebody who hates public speaking, right? How, how do you factor all of that in? when you're preparing and, and helping that person be successful. I know it's, it's a, those are two questions from the audience that we're, that we've wrapped together here. So yeah, give you a moment to process that. Whoever wants to start can just jump in. Something that um, I found really interesting yesterday was the State of the Union address. Um, and there was an article, I think it was in the New York Times that talked about his process, President Biden's process, and you know, he has a stutter. So it's really hard for him to do public speaking and he's really worked on that. Um, and so it was, it was really great to read about his process of just practicing over and over again, um, making some shorthand notes, breaking things up into different chunks. Um, and also, you know, reading something and just saying, like recognizing if it didn't sound like him. And that reminded me of um, former mayor, Marty Walsh, actually. He was very, very similar. Um, and I think they have similar speaking styles. Um, Mira Walsh was very straightforward. Um, he was very clear. And that actually really challenged me to look at what I was writing and try to just boil it down to the essence um, and to make sure that the, the impact was really clear. Um, so I just kind of laughed to myself yesterday reading that. I'm like, yeah, that sounds familiar. <laughs> I can also speak to um, writing for a principal who doesn't love public speaking. I think the mayor has been quite upfront. Mayor Mayor Wu has been quite upfront about the fact that public speaking is not something that she inherently enjoys. Um, I think she said a few times that she much prefers to listen rather than to speak. Um, and I think another challenge with with this particular mayor is her um, her. Uh, intimate familiarity with policy, right? Like she really is like a policy wonk. She knows the policies that she advocates for, the legislation, the landscape. She knows it all very, very well. Um, and in in a book by Chip and Dan Heath called Made to Stick, um, which is one of the books that is recommended by West Wing writers when you when you join the firm, um, and one that sort of gets back into this idea of thinking like your principal in order to be able to write like your principal, they talk about the sort of um, the curse of knowledge. When you're an expert on something, it sometimes can be very challenging then to talk about it in a way that doesn't sort of presume or assume that same level of expertise within your audience, you sort of forget that people, and to Nancy's point, I think previously about some of the jargon, right? And I think that's one of our biggest responsibilities as a speechwriter is to make content accessible, um, often for people who are deeply, intimately familiar with it at an expert level, but for people who are not. And so I think for Mayor Wu, uh, a solution for both of those things is to really make the content of her speech um, far more conversational. So on the, on the end of like, um, the, to the to the extent that we are able to make her speeches feel like she's having a conversation with a friend, like on a tactical level, both in terms of the diction that we use and the style, right? Like a bit of what Nancy also was saying around like getting rid of grammar when it's not serving you, right? Just being colloquial and conversational. I think that also puts her a little bit more at ease because then it feels like she's having a conversation rather than being stuffy and standing behind a podium and speaking at people or lecturing. And that also serves the second like dual function of if you put your content sort of into a conversational frame, chances are you're not using high level technical language or jargon. And so you're making it more accessible for the audience that's listening. That's really helpful. Uh, I think when we're thinking about about our principle, something that's come up more recently is, is this notion of artificial intelligence. I'm sure we've been keeping up with the news on chat GPT. And uh, yeah, what are your thoughts? I mean, are there pros and cons to, to using these, particularly as a speech writer? I don't want to presume to know the answer to this, but uh, I'm re we're really curious about your thoughts. 
So I actually just learned about ChatGBT. I had kind of heard about it, but uh, um, my husband is a professor. And so he was telling me about it and he showed me. And so we actually wrote in, write a speech about transportation for a large city. And then sure enough, it just spewed out this like 500 word thing. And it was pretty horrifying. Um, but then when you stop and read it, I mean, it's, it's um, sure it's like technically right. And it has like key phrases in there and it might be good as a starting point for someone who's writing a speech, but it definitely lacks that human element. Um, but it, it was pretty scary to see this computer just, you know, blast out the speech. <laughs> yeah. And as a professor, I, I feel that. <laughs> I feel that as well. Yeah. I, I mean, go ahead, Ezra, you go ahead. I think just one thing I would I would add there, um, or to tie back to a pre uh, an earlier element of our conversation around sort of making content accessible. I haven't read this article, so I cannot fully endorse it. I know this is a dangerous practice, but I have heard that there was an article um, about Chat GPT sort of explaining degrowth to various to to people of various ages. So how would you explain degrowth to a PhD candidate? How would you explain degrowth to a high school student? How would you explain degrowth to an elementary school student, to a 10-year-old, to a 5-year-old? And I think to the extent that machine learning and AI has virtually infinite access to information and the ability to sort of synthesize all of it in in a way that can again, to Nancy's point, like serve as a starting point for us as like maybe a bit of a, a thought partner, partner or, or a catalyst to where you eventually hope to go or want to go. And certainly as a, as, a, as a poet, I have a vested interest in this idea that machines will never be able to replace the sort of soul and humanity and wit that human, human beings can instill in a piece of writing. Um, but I think as a starting point and to, to get at some of the more um, mechanical elements of breaking ideas down and to just kind of see what's out there and have something to be able to respond to, I think it, I think it could serve as a relatively useful tool. Well, and I think too, that the use case that you're representing Ezra could be helpful for gaining a bit more insight into your audience and that audience perspective and helping you, um, look at the, the topic from their point of view. And so, I think this is a good transition. Let's start to talk a little bit more about our audiences and connecting with them and persuading them. And, and when you think about that connection point and, and prompting them to take some sort of action or, or have some sort of feeling at the end of this, you know, how do you, how do you ensure that your principal is going to connect with the audience? How do you ensure that you'll have that connection in place to then therefore have the outcome that you're looking for? I don't want to keep, yeah, go ahead, Michael. I said, I want to pick on Michael again, but I, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I think also like this audience question connects a bit with the like chat GPT thing mm -hmm. is that you have, like, I don't think AI is rhetorically sound or culturally competent enough to like figure out what's necessary for an audience. And because a lot of speakers, even with an actual speech writer, um, aren't rhetorically sound or culturally competent enough to <laughs> connect with their full audiences. And I think one of the problems with that is, is a lack of understanding or doing the fundamental research of who's your audience or who you're speaking to, which is a problem, but also trying to inauthentically um, build relationships with the audience or saying, I'm going to try and say what I think they want to hear versus saying something authentic to me that may values align with them or it may not, but at least the audience might respect me for being authentic. And it's being able to navigate that conundrum with your principle is important because one thing about people that we're often able to notice is that we can catch when someone's like not being authentic. And so when you're a speaker on like a stage and you're not being authentic, then all of a sudden, then things go left real quick. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's I think that's important. Authenticity really goes a long way. And when you're starting to think about um your audience being made up of different types of people, like you talked about it from an ideas perspective, right? They might not hold the same ideas as you, but um, what about if um, your audience is, is representing different backgrounds, different experiences? You know, how do you write in a way that's going to resonate with a diverse audience 
um, and then and then I've got a follow up from our uh, from one of our attendees as well on that. Nancy, do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, and to echo echo Michael's point, um, research really is so crucial, um, and and knowing your audience. And you know, I, I was just thinking about how. Um, you know, working for the city, you write about so many different issues and so many different communities and often communities that you're not yourself familiar with. Um, and so, you know, if there's someone like, let's say you're writing for a religious service and it's a particular religion you're not familiar with, being able to talk to someone and to like, learn more about the values, um, what are they looking to hear from, you know, from the principal um, and just letting yourself be open and, um, and curious too. And I think that naturally brings out that authenticity too that Michael was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think to Michael and Nancy's point, research goes a really long way, but not only just um, research and community outreach, but not only just as speechwriters, but also for your principal, for your organization, right? Like I think that there is an important role that humility plays in speechwriting, where speech writing isn't sorcery. It's not a magical solution, right? Like I think candidly, a lot of what we're talking about here often needs to take place outside the realm of speech writing, right? It's important that I'm not just going and talking to the community and getting feedback on like what people want to hear, but also that our policy team, that our, our community engagement team, that the mayor is out in community. One of her big things is getting city hall out of city hall. All of the people who are actually shaping the policy, who are actually leading, who are actually implementing and executing on programs and initiatives also need to be doing that outreach. And all of that then can inform the remarks, but often the remarks are not the goal, right? Like the remarks should not be driving policy. Policy should be driving the remarks. And so I think it's important to sort of understand your locus in the in, in the sort of community that you're serving and recognizing the importance that all of the relevant stakeholders are engaging all of the relevant stakeholders. So the it's the speech is one tool in the organization or the principal's toolbox to connect with audiences. It's not going to be the be all end all savior for things, right? It's a really important point. A couple other uh, challenging questions for us uh, from our attendee. One of our attendees asks, when writing a speech about a difficult subject like systemic racism, are there additional steps taken to make the speech resonate with all, including those who don't believe the subject is important or even exists? Can you reach everybody? If I were to boil that question down. Uh, I can start there. No, you can't. And it's okay. Some folks are going to be racist and don't want to acknowledge the fact. And it is what it is. But what you can do is you can come with the data, you can come with the facts, and you can come with the realness of something existing, like in terms of systematic racism. Like it's a really good example, because like you can provide all the data, facts, rhetorically sound evidence you want. And folks will just hold their nose and be like, nah, I don't write with that. I don't believe that you're playing the race card or whatever mess they may say there. And you just got to chalk up those losses sometimes and just keep it pushing. I think I have um, two thoughts there. One that very much affirms what Michael is saying around sort of you will never be able to please everyone. And I think ties back also to his point around like authenticity, where if you just assume that half of the room is going to love what you say and half the room is going to hate what you're going to say, then you might as well say the thing that makes you happy and go with the people that are enjoy like and satisfy half of the room and be happy rather than satisfying half of the room and being sad and inauthentic or saying something that, you know, feels self-deceiving. Um, and then the second thing I think really is, is a question of what is your objective in discussing whatever issue is at hand, no matter how controversial, like, what are you hoping to do? What is the work at the center? What is it that you want to accomplish? And um, my partner serves as a leadership coach at the Harvard Kennedy School, and they have a series of classes on adaptive leadership where they talk about the importance of imagining deeply into other people's pain and the role of holding people through the losses when you ask something of them. And I think that this can be very challenging and uh, straight up repugnant to do sometimes, certainly as a person of color, the idea of holding particularly white people or anyone who doesn't believe that systemic racism is a real th thing, to the idea of holding them through the pain of, of sort of 
forcing them to confront this idea that racism is real, which has inherent losses for people who have benefited from racism for generations, right? Like there are real losses there. And I think they're losses that we all agree they need to take, but they are losses. And I think to the extent that we want to be successful in converting people to understanding that these systems are real and these systems are unjust and there are things that we have to do in order to rectify them, there is perhaps an element of recognizing, hey, what we're asking from you is not nothing, right? But it is the right thing to do. And I think doing that is perhaps one of the most challenging things and virtually impossible to do in a speech that doesn't give you enough space to do it. And I would just add, I completely agree with Ezra and Michael's points. And I would add that that really shows why it's so important that um, you believe in who you're writing for. I, I really feel like I, I need to write for someone who um, I share common values with um, and who I think similarly as um, because of because of those kinds of reasons. And you know, I think um, you know, take for granted that we live in a, a liberal hub here in Boston. Um, but you know, it's there are so many you know, people have all different kinds of opinions and you know it's when you're running the city you're running the city for everyone um and so yeah just understanding that some people won't agree but you have to do what's right thank you thank you for that insight i think it's it's really valuable um, i want to talk about one more audience related question from one of our attendees uh it's it's not as as deep as um as diversity but i think it's it's a challenge for sure uh, when you're thinking about speeches that are given in the dark or maybe have a PowerPoint accompaniment with it. Um, it's very easy to lose your audience into their phones or the bathroom or, or something else. So, you know, what hints do you have in that kind of setting to try to hold your audience's attention and keep them involved? And as a professor, I really enjoy this question. I think, um, yeah, I think it's a perennial challenge. I think maybe the biggest thing that I can say is in a situation like this, you're sort of already set up for failure given the circumstances of today's society and people's um, continually decreasing attention spans and the prevalence of, you know, technology is just in your pocket, right? And so it's just really hard to compete with that, the entire world at your fingertips. Um, and so I think the biggest question you can ask yourself up front is how long does this really need to be, right? Or or even better, people love, right? Like, could this be an email, right? Um, but if the answer is no, and the answer is it has to be at least five minutes, then to the extent that you can work in sort of audience engagement questions that aren't rhetorical questions, but are actual questions, right? Like shifting the medium to be more Socratic, more dialogue-based, um, and then also, of course, just storytelling and surprise, right? Like the elements of a story where you create tension and then relieve that tension, right? Like you create tension in your audience and they want you to relieve it for them. I think, and, and different sort of poetic tactics and rhetorical tactics around making it sonically interesting, right? Just using syllabics and assonance and consonants, right? Just things that like people are like, oh, it's sound like aesthetically, it's even just nice for me to be paying attention rather than sitting in silence or zoning out and being on my phone. There are a lot of different levers that you can pull as a writer to, to try and hold your audience's attention. I think something that happens to a lot of us from the corporate world is the PowerPoint drives the speech as opposed to the speech driving the speech. And the PowerPoint is just that visual to enhance or to help you expand. And I think if you if you rethink it and and consider that presentation to be more of a speech and the emphasis is on the, per, the principal delivering the remarks, that might help shift the energy and focus where it needs to be to keep that audience engaged. So that's, that's a really helpful perspective. I just want to let the audience know we have about 10 minutes left. I'm going, I have a few more questions myself that I want us to get through. I have a few more audience questions, but if you have more questions that you want to ask, please go ahead and get them, get them into the Q&A queue so that we can get those answered. If we think about careers, are there books or resources that have helped you 
in strengthening your career, your speech writing practice? So um, there's one there's one book that I um, I used to read pretty frequently or refer to frequently. Um, I had to, I apologize, I had to look it up on my phone to make sure I got it right in case anyone was interested. Um, the Political Speechwriter's Companion by Robert Lerman. Um, I actually used that as my textbook when I when I taught at Emerson. Um, and it just really breaks down the elements of writing a good speech and, and not, it, I mean, it says politics in the title, but it's really for any kind of speech that you're giving. Um, and so, you know, when you're feeling kind of stuck or you need some motivation, you just turn to it and it just helps you, you know, pick up on a good uh, a good starting point at least. But can you that's really helpful. Can you repeat that title one more time for our oh, audience? Sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, the Political Speechwriter's Companion. Thank you, Nancy. Thank mm -hmm. you. Michael or Ezra, any other resources you'd recommend? Um, okay, there's a few. I definitely would emphasize the Political Speechwriter's Companion. It's excellent and really gives the fundamentals. Um, I also would recommend reading like compilations of speeches of like notable folks really help just figure out the process and just seeing some different methodologies. So for me, one is Sister Outsider from Audre Lorde, and it's just a compilation of essays and speeches um, that she delivered throughout her life. I also would recommend um, the Professional Speechwriters Association. They have lots of different resources and even a speechwriting school that folks can take part in either a one day training in person or um, over six weeks in online training that essentially runs through those fundamentals of the political speech writers companion. I think Bob Learman and Eric Schnur actually end up teaching sometimes as a part of that school, but just getting those fundamentals is key and just reading other written works and speeches is so important. Totally. Quickly to tack on here, um, to Michael's point around a compilation of speeches, um, in our own words, Extraordinary Speeches of the American Century is a fascinating, fascinating collection of a ton of different speeches that was gifted to me um, by the CEO of a communications firm that I worked at when I first was sort of um, discovering my love of speech writing. On Speaking Well by Peggy Noonan is a classic. Um, I also have a list of a number of poems that I love to return to when I'm feeling like a little bit writer's blocked that I think do wonderful things with both language and storytelling that I think are applicable to speech writing. Um, I'm not going to drop all of them here now, but uh, you can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever, Ezra Bailey Wong, and if you're interested in, in a list of poems from me, I'm happy to share those. Um, and then I think also... Um, George Saunders' 2013 commencement speech at Syracuse, as well as Diane Seuss's commencement to the Bennington writers that I mentioned earlier. And then also West Wing Writers has a wonderful Medium page where they have folks from the firm who are professional speech writers analyze speeches. Um, oh, and one more book actually recently published by Jeff Nussbaum, who used to work at West Wing Writers, Undelivered. Um, a collection of speeches that never were right like their speeches that were written and then never ended up being delivered and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of fascinating sort of behind the scenes commentary from him in that one as well. Yeah, oh, sorry. oh. <laughs> go ahead Nancy and then we'll go to Michael. <laughs> I just get so excited about books. Um, and that actually reminds me Ezra of um, there's this compilation called Speeches of Note by um, Sean Usher again had to look it up. Uh, just want to make sure I had it right. Um, it it's a really nice like leather bound book, and it would make like a great um, you know coffee table kind of read. But it has similar speeches of you know I think there was one uh, with um, sending you know astronauts to the moon. Like if that didn't go well, there was a speech written for the president to give if that turned into a disaster. So speeches that were never given mm -hmm. um, are included in that, and it's just beautifully laid out too. It's just like a really cool thing to have and show people. It sounds like a good gift idea um, as well. Michael, what were you going to say? I was going to add, I needed to look up to ensure I got the website right, but um, Dana Rubin has created the Speaking While Female speech bank that has just a whole bunch of phenomenal speeches from women throughout history. And there's actually a book coming out later this spring where she's built an anthology of 75 speeches or so from just women throughout history who have given amazing speeches. And I know that's definitely something I'll be adding to my collection. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for all these wonderful suggestions. Uh, we do have a couple of, of questions. Let's see if we can get through them 
super fast because we are running out of time. One question is, um, there's a, a, a new er speechwriter in the Boston area, and is wondering if there's any sort of speechwriters group or Google group that exists. And uh, if not, maybe they can get one going. You know of anyone that exists, like a professional network of speechwriters? I don't, but I would be down to get one going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Uh, two more questions. Uh, one, we started talking about this, Nancy. So I want to go back to the, the moon, um, the astronaut speech, right? And the one that didn't go well. Uh, one of our attendees wants to know, you know, if you're writing a speech for a difficult topic, like a mistake or an apology, uh, you know, what are there any special tactics that you use to make sure that you're striking the right tone? And again, we, we don't have a ton of time. So I just want to get you going on that. Yeah, I mean, I think just um, going back to authenticity, excuse me, um, just, you know, being, I, I immediately thought of like a condolence speech or, you know, if like the mayor would give speeches at funerals, eulogies, just really um, just being honest, being compassionate. Um, again, like Michael was saying, the audience will know that and they will sense that authenticity. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I think some of the comments that we've made earlier around empathy uh, definitely would carry forward in that engagement or that as well. Uh, the last question that we have from the audience, do you find yourselves writing differently for virtual speaking engagements versus in-person events? Michael, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I think it's harder to like drive engagement um, in virtual events compared to in-person. And especially I'm someone that I really am fueled by positive reinforcement. So like, I will be the one to be like, hey, post something in the chat box sometimes. Or like, if I have a principal that's fueled similarly, then making sure there's a way for them to see the reaction in real time somehow virtually, which is different compared to in-person. Yeah. Great point. Anything else different virtual versus in-person? I love that that engagement, that feedback element, Michael. I think that's really important. I think um, you know, with Zoom, you know, you're able to read something like while you're scrolling, while you're actually speaking. But to that point too, you know, you're not really getting the audience reaction. And so, um, what I try to do at least is to write shorter sentences. Um, and when I was writing for the mayor, especially when COVID started, and he was just getting used to Zoom and and um, in online conferencing, I would provide more of like an outline template that, you know, it's something that he could jump off on and expand from there because it is different. Yeah, I think the difference for me too is like primarily tactical. I think it's just larger font, right? And mm -hmm. I think it's shorter sentences. And also to Nancy's point around an outline format, I'm not sure if this is what you were saying, but for us, we do like, we'll keep the headers in Mm -hmm. Whereas like actually for in-person remarks, we'll cut those headers that are sort of the organizational structure of like, oh, this is this section, this is that section, but we'll keep them in for Zoom. Great. Um, I wish we could keep this, this uh, session going, uh, but unfortunately we are running out of time before we depart. I want to give a, a, a big thank you to Nancy, to Ezra, to Michael for your time, for your thoughts and your insights. I, I think it's it's um, it's been an amazing conversation. Uh, all of your recommendations have been so useful. So um, I'll, I'll give you the claps of since <laughs> the positive reinforcement, we can't see all of our audience's reactions. And I just want to um, remind people who are listening, we have a really fascinating um, calm talk coming up uh, next Thursday, a week from tomorrow, it's about the evolution of Nollywood. And it's about how Nigeria has become a global film and television powerhouse. So it's really exciting. Uh, I think people from Com will put the, the link in the chat, but it's going to be at uh, bu.edu slash com slash event. And we will, um, I think I can do that actually, bu.edu slash com slash events to understand a little bit more about the day and the time uh, next Thursday, 3 p.m. about Nollywood. So thank you again for your time today, for our panelists, for our excellent questions from our audience and to the College of Communication for organizing this event. And I hope you all have a rest of your wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having thank me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.